I'm Joe Windish, and this is a presentation I did for the Future of the Book Conference held at Florida State University's Turnbull Conference Center in Tallahassee, Florida on July 21st and 22nd, 2011. My title, Is Book a Verb, comes from Boing Boing blogger and copyright activist Cory Doctorow, who observes that we read more words on screens than we do on paper, and he said in a 2005 interview that book is not a physical object. It's not a thing that you hold. It's a thing that you do. It's a practice. It's a verb, not a noun. The social future of the book is imagined by Bob Stein, a keynote speaker at our Florida conference and the founder and director of the Institute for the Future of the Book. Stein suggests in a 2009 interview that instead of giving an author an upfront advance to go off and write a book, how about we give that same money to the author to go off and blog the book with the help of paying subscribers? And we're not all that far away from that right now. Blogging, tweeting, and Facebook are as much a publicity staple as the traditional book tour, and increasingly authors are involving the audience up front as they write through their blogs, Twitter streams, and other social media platforms. So let's run through a quick history of blogs. The first online diaries show up in 1994, the first use of the word weblog in 1997. But at that time, if I were a betting man, I would have gone with webzine or ezine, which were pithy contenders for the title. It wasn't until the founding of Blogger in 1999, the first easy, open, and free online publishing platform that blog, blogger, and blogging entered the lexicon. Google bought Blogger in 2003, and reports now are that the name will be retired, along with Picasa, in an effort to do a better job of Google corporate branding. From 1999 to 2004, there were a couple significant news stories that gave blogs traction. In 2002, at the 100th birthday party of Senator Strom Thurmond, Senator Trent Lott said that had Thurmond been elected president on the Dixiecrat ticket in 1948, the United States, quote, wouldn't have had all these problems, unquote. The traditional media reported that story, then let it pass, but liberal bloggers, notably Josh Marshall's Talking Points memo, kept up the reporting until Lott was forced to resign from his leadership position. In 2004, 60 Minutes called into question President George W. Bush's military service record, citing four documents the authenticity of which Little Green Footballs, a conservative blog, called into question within hours after the broadcast. In what came to be known as the Rathergate scandal, one producer was fired and several news executives were asked to step down. 2004 to 2007, niche blogs take off. In 2004, the word blog is Merriam Webster's word of the year. 2005, lolcats arrive. 2006, you are Time Magazine's person of the year. 2007 to 2011, blogs go mainstream. Before 2007, your blog had a shot of hitting the big time. After 2007, traditional media companies hired up those successful bloggers who hadn't already turned their blogs into profit-making ventures. Where once they quoted bloggers, now they start their own. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and others now each host dozens and dozens of blogs. And those blogs are far more inclined to talk among themselves than to quote outsiders. Finally, 2011, the New York Observer on the end of blogs. Tweeting is easier, Facebook friendlier, Foursquare badges mystifyingly fun. So why do blogs matter? Well, I think it's because they are one indication of a shift in the means of cultural transmission. How do we tell our stories? How do we pass them on? In the sweep of history, we move from an oral tradition to a literal tradition, from an oral means of cultural transmission to a literal one, and I think now we're moving to a social one. The oral tradition was all about telling stories, and those stories were less about precise technical accuracy and more about whole idiomatic truths. That was the storytelling art. Along comes the alphabet, arguably the first information technology, and with it the question, would writing aid memory or would writing harm memory? This question is the same question we're asking today when we wonder, is Google making us stupid? Are our technologies harming our cognitive capacities? We don't remember phone numbers because our smartphones do it for us. Is that good or bad? This earlier question was definitively answered with the invention of the printing press some 15 centuries later, which brought us books. And books gave us established facts and definitive authority, two defining attributes of the literal age. A look at the impact of recording on music performance will help make this clear. 
Prior to the phonograph, what concert audiences enjoyed was the variation of live and impromptu performance. After the phonograph, what audiences demand is a precise technical replication of what they heard on the recording. Variation becomes defined as a mistake, and musicians are required to parrot the same thing over and over again. The literal era requires a precise technical representation of culture, and Google's going to give it to us. Google Books has digitized 50 million fiction and nonfiction volumes published from 1800 to 2000, and a mathematician and a genomicist have come together at Harvard, funded by Google with the backing of the American Heritage Dictionary and the Encyclopedia Britannica, to create and study culture omics, like genomics, only using culture. And their goal is to bring us a quantitative analysis of culture. Open to all of us, the Google Books Ngram viewer lets us enter any words we like and chart their appearance over the centuries. This one was popular when the project made itself public in science last winter. It charts politics, culture, and sports, and finds that only sports stays steady. Politics rises and culture spikes in the last decade. If Google represents the pinnacle of the literal age, and I do believe it does, Facebook is pointing us towards our social future, a social means of transmitting culture. Where the literal era was all about the product, and that product was the book, the social tradition is all about the process, and what that process does is infuse the literal tradition with oral attributes, and the poster child for that is Wikipedia. But wait. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Am I really saying that a social tradition means we are free to believe whatever we want, just find it on the internet and go ahead and believe it? And there are some worrisome indicators that, hey, that's what's happening. A look at the anti-science movement, evolution, and climate change skepticism all give reason to worry. Only four in ten Americans believe in evolution. It's just a theory, the skeptics claim. So what's going on here, and how do I explain that? What I think is that institutions, norms, traditions, and practices have yet to be established. We had a whole elaborate apparatus built around our literal tradition. We've yet to build that up for a social tradition. But we are beginning to establish one. And here, again, the poster child is Wikipedia. We all remember when Wikipedia was harshly criticized for all that it got wrong. Well, today Wikipedia is highly regarded, and I think that's because Wikipedia has actually instituted new procedures, new practices. It's establishing new norms and new traditions, and that's working. In any given month, one-third of the people on the planet visit Wikipedia. Three years ago, it was ranked number seven. Three months ago, it was ranked number seven. For the last 30 days, it was ranked number seven. Last week, it was ranked number seven among all sites visited on the web. Most search results have Wikipedia entries in the top 10, and that's significant. Wikipedia is an important, non-profit, non-commercial media presence. Compare it to public television. How many public television programs are in the top seven? But what about books? good old hardback or paperback books. Ray Kurzweil is an important futurist most widely known for his belief in exponential progress and the singularity, that future time when technological intelligence first transcends human intelligence, then merges with it to transform us. Kurzweil says that new communication paradigms don't eclipse old. They generally expand the pie, and they are profoundly democratizing. So movies didn't end theater, television didn't end radio, and books aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Kevin Kelly, a founding editor of Wired magazine, in What Technology Wants, describes the technium. In it, precursor technologies make new iterations both possible and inevitable. The lone inventor is a figment of our cultural imagination. Google learned this when it pushed out globally a Google Doodle celebrating the Wright brothers' invention of flight. Turns out, in Brazil, they think their guy, Alberto Santos Dumont, he did it, and he deserves that doodled acknowledgement. Kelly goes on to say that technology evolves, but extinction never happens. He went back to the 1895 Montgomery Ward catalog, picked out some tools, and found that each of them is still being produced new today. NPR's Robert Krulwich decided to challenge him, so he went through that same catalog and looked up every single tool in it. Turns out, each and every one of them is still being manufactured new today. 
So with that, it looks to me like the book as object is bound to be around for a long time to come. But how about those cognitive questions? A slew of new books minds nascent neuroscience to worry about the impact of the internet on our brain. Timothy Taylor is a British anthropologist with a provocative theory. He says, yes, sure, our technology is altering our brains, but it was always and ever thus. He says that Darwin got it wrong. We are an example of survival of the weakest. We evolved symbiotically with our technology. He says that without our technology, we would surely die, and that our technology has always and will always extend us. In The Artificial Ape, he notes that while our cranial capacity peaked long, long ago, our capacities are enhanced and extended through our technology. Sight, for example. Even those of us with deficiencies wear glasses and can use binoculars, telescopes, and microscopes to see far beyond what would be possible through Darwinian evolution alone. So we're left with the business model. Some of us look back at publishing through rose-colored glasses. Books have never been easily profitable. Newspapers have been most profitable through monopoly. To close, here's On the Media's Brooke Gladstone, reading from a 1902 New York Times article on books that die. I've illustrated it with images from bookshelfporn.com. In 1902, the New York Times ran a piece called Books That Die, The Tragic Fate of Unsold Books. The writer, George Owen Koch, began by observing that a new book was full of possibility. Who knew how far it would go? Quote, Some volumes turn to the right and follow that branch of the path which leads them to readers, with whom they remain for a while. Others halt and then turn to the left. Their way is short. In the undertaker's shop of the stock dealer, the books that have died in the nursery for lack of attention meet brothers who have seen the world and have been worn out in the service of mankind. But to the funeral director, they are all the same. Put into bales weighing from 500 to 1,500 pounds each, the books are sent on the last stage of their journey to the cemeteries of the mills, where during interment in great tubs, they undergo a cleansing and altering process truly purgatorial to emerge free from stains of inky sins. But books no longer. As man begins movement toward the grave at the moment of his conception, so a book starts on its way to the boiling vats of the mill at the moment of its inspiration. Some volumes, like some men, reach a great age, yet final disintegration is inevitable. There are uncommon instances of the petrification of human bodies after life is extinct. There are instances of the petrification of old volumes after a period of usefulness. But these, too, shall pass away, for books and men are embalmed permanently only in memory. So is book a verb? No, I think not, unless you choose the urban dictionary meaning. But the social future of the book, it's here and happening now, and it's not going away. It's nothing to be afraid of. Yes, there are great challenges, but great opportunities come with them. We can beat those challenges, and we should embrace the opportunity. My sources are all linked here. This presentation is licensed through a Creative Commons Sharealike copyright, and you can find it at bit.ly isbookaverb.